we're going to begin today with a meditation. And the meditation is on the actual sermon title, which is a koan. And the koan is, the world is medicine. What type of medicine are you? Now, I don't know who knows what about koans in the Zen tradition, so I'm going to just talk about them for a couple of minutes before we begin the actual meditation. So in Zen, koans serve a similar purpose to a mantra in other traditions. They serve as a way to focus your attention and as the point to bring your attention back to when you are, when you are meditating. But koans also serve another purpose in the Zen tradition, which is that they help people to transcend their thoughts about self and world, the, the patterns of thinking, the patterns of emotion. So they're really to help you kind of punch through the way you think and to come closer to enlightenment. So Philip Kaplow Roshi, and a Roshi is a Zen master, talks about koans this way. And there are many ways that they're talked about. He calls them linguistic puzzles or problems. And they present you with often very strange connections that you can't logic your way through. We like to use our, our linear logic, our sequential logic. And the Zen koan kind of confounds that. For example, one koan is, step off the 100-foot pole and show your whole body in every direction. Try to apply your linear logic to that one. <laughs> so koans may be a word. They may be a statement. They may be a question. They may be a story. One of the very famous ones that is often used very early in a person's uh, study is mu. And I apologize if any of you speak Chinese, except my mispronunciation there, but it means no. And you can have that koan given to you, the word no, and sit with that for quite a while and let's watch it unfold in your life. Now, it comes from a story, and the story is about a student who goes to his teacher and he asks his teacher, does a dog have Buddha nature? And the teacher very harshly says, no! <laughs> now, he isn't saying no to does a dog have Buddha nature or not. He's saying no to the entire question, saying the question is ridiculous. The question is absurd. The question keeps you locked in holistic thinking. Um, so no is taken out of that. Uh, a statement might be something like vast emptiness, nothing sacred. A question might be something like what is the sound of one hand? You've all heard that as one hand clapping, but that actually the clapping is not in the Zen koan. Joan Sutherland, uh, another Roshi, talks about koans as a way to have a direct experience. And she talks about them like art. Like, you might look at a painting and get a feeling of peace. The koan is designed to give you that direct experience. It's not saying, this is what peace looks like. It's allowing you to feel peace. John Tarrant adds another layer to this, and he calls koans a poetic technology. He says that they access your metaphorical brain, your symbolic brain, and they make you make leaps that you would not normally make. And the way he describes it, it's not just one, two, three, four, six. He says it's more like one, two, three, four, rhinoceros. So, <laughs> I will, I will close this little bit about koans with uh, John Dato Lori, who is the abbot at the Zen Mountain Monastery, and these are his words. He says, quote, the common view of koans describes them as riddles or paradoxes, but the fact is there are no paradoxes. Paradox exists only in language, in the words and ideas that describe reality. In reality, there are no paradoxes. In order to see into a koan, we must go beyond the words and ideas that describe reality and directly and intimately experience reality itself. The answer to a koan is not a fixed piece of information. It's one's own intimate and direct experience of the universe and its infinite facets. It's a state of consciousness. So with that, we're going to start a little meditation. Now in Zen, we sit for 25 minutes at a shot. 
Now, I know if I did that with UUs, there would be an insurrection among other things. <laughs> so what we're going to do is just try it for two or three minutes. We'll just give you a, a, a real short one. Your mind is going to wander. That's what happens. And you will also try to solve the koan. You're going to intellectually engage with it. But what I'll ask you to do is just keep returning to the words. Just keep coming back to the words and let them unfold for you. Let them, let them change for you. So I'll begin with three bells. And I will periodically repeat the koan as you sit. So find yourself a comfortable position. And the koan, again, is the world is medicine. What type of medicine are you? Was, believe it or not, three minutes of meditation. Jennifer said it could not be done in the Unitarian Church. <laughs> she warned me against it. I just said, don't do ten. <laughs> so the world is medicine. What type of medicine are you? What I'm going to do for the sermon today is really tell you my journey with this koan, with some side points along the way. So when I first encountered this koan, I really couldn't say or believe the world is medicine. I could sit with, and I could accept, and I could work with the idea that the world is full of medicine, that it contains medicine. You know, I looked around me and I looked at the people I knew, the families and friends that I had, and I could see that you guys were bringing medicine into the world in all sorts of ways, in the ways that you worked with others, in the ways that you did your jobs, in the ways that you treated your families, in, in the ways that you respected your lives. I, I could see that in my family and friends. I could see they were bringing medicine into the world, that they were filling the world with medicine. I looked around and I could see churches. I could see uh, community centers, schools. I could see behavioral health services and centers for holistic medicine, hospitals and acupuncturists. There were AA meetings, parks and coffee shops. You know, the list goes on and on about the medicines that were in the world. But the world is medicine. The very fabric of being is healing. I had trouble with that. I couldn't accept that. As I sat with the koan, as I as I continued to sit with it over a period of months, things began to happen. And I began to think about the desert, which is our home. And it's a place of extremes. And yet, even in this extreme environment, things grow everywhere. Life is everywhere without even a drop of water for encouragement. Barrel cactus are out there blooming. Saguaro cactus are out there blooming. I'm from the east. Palo Verde trees have green trunks. I was amazed at that. <laughs> Everything is absorbing light. And I just learned recently that mesquite trees, this is from one of our own members who's a scientist, they was telling me that mesquite trees they've discovered, they hold water in their root systems like a cistern. And they drink from that, you know, throughout the year. I was blown away when I began to look at the desert a different way. 
I was amazed at what I was seeing. And I began to think of all the extreme environments on our planet where things live. Right now, as we speak, there are fish at the bottom of this ocean that have never seen light, that are in the crushing weight of, I don't know how many tons per square inch, and they make their own light. How fabulous is that? How amazing is that? So I began to really um, ride a pink cloud about this. I was like, I was in awe. I'm going, yeah, 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 yeah. This is, this is really cool. Maybe the world is medicine. And then my brain clicked in. And my brain does this all the time. And I began to think, well, OK, I'm a little embarrassed about this feeling that I'm having. I mean, I'm being a little romantic here. I'm being a little Pollyannic. I'm being a little unrealistic. I mean, this world is also full of a lot of junk and crap and awful things. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm an English person, as, as, uh, as uh, Margaret said, and so I went to William Blake, and he wrote The Lamb and the Tiger, and the Lamb's a poem about all the innocence and the wonder and the beauty, and the tiger's its question begins, or ends with, did he who make, made the lamb make thee? You know, there's evil in this world. You know, it's, it's wonderful and wonder-filled. And it's awful, not just awful. So what about things that are inequitable? What about unfairness? What about injustice? What about immorality? What about things that are unethical? What about catastrophes? Nature is beautiful, but it's brutal. What about people? They're beautiful, but they're brutal too. How does this fit into the world is medicine? I felt resistant. That's a good way to say that. What I heard as I sought instruction was Zen teacher saying, mind had arisen. My mind had surfaced.